Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Kevin. I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) Hi, everybody. So I wanted to start by by thanking Clay and the others uh, for inviting me to to be here tonight and and do this. Um, It's been a while since I've told my story, and uh, it's always a good reminder to think back and and, uh, uh, consider where I came from, how I got to where I am, and, uh, you know, and where I am right now. So um, I came from a long line of alcoholics. Um, in in Michigan, and uh, my uh, great grandfather was the town drunk of um, a little town in northern Michigan, and uh, one of the family stories is about how he and his brother sold the family home um, while they were out drinking one night, took the cash, and started walking through the snow north towards Canada. <laughs> and if you know Michigan, you know that you cannot walk to Canada through. <laughs> There's a great big lake in between. Uh, my grandmother uh, went after them, got the money uh, from them, and went back and bought the house back from whoever it was that uh, they had sold it to. Uh, then uh, go to the next generation. That grandmother married an alcoholic, and um, uh, he was a raging alcoholic. And um, uh, they, the two of them had seven children. All seven of those children were alcoholics. Um, including my dad. Um, That grandfather um, died in an insane asylum at age 51 of alcohol-related reasons. Um, I found out um, as an adult uh, when I was working for a hospital in in Flint, Michigan, uh, where we all lived at that time, um, that uh, um, the uh, maintenance shop for the hospital, which was this beautiful old brick building, um, was actually the asylum, and I was talking to the director of maintenance for the hospital standing in that building and came to the realization that my grandfather had died in that building as an alcoholic. Um, the, uh, uh, we, we get to my, my dad's generation. Um, there were various levels of um, raging alcoholism among them. Um, my dad fortunately was not one of those. He was a pretty nice guy. He was, uh, he always worked. Um, he was pretty dependable. Uh, and, um, our family dynamics were such that, um, my mother decided I was her favorite. And so she kind of talked to me and confided in me in a way that, you know, I, I grew to realize was pretty inappropriate, um, when I got to be an adult. And, um, what she confided in me was how much she disliked my dad, what a what a rotten husband he was, and um, that he was an alcoholic. And and I I didn't like my dad for for a long time while I was young. Um, I let her influence me. Um, and part of what that brought me to was was the thinking that I I will not grow up to be like my dad. I will not be an alcoholic. Um, I. Uh, did do a lot of acting out. So so my mother would tell stories about how once a year she'd have to go up to the school and talk to the, the principal about what, <laughs> what I had done that year, like getting kicked out of school for leading a band of boys smoking cigarettes um, off ground in the fourth grade. That was uh, kind of stupid, right? And uh, um, and, there, and there were always incidents like that. Well, when I was 14, I got a job. I was underage, but uh, the the uh, drugstore owner hired me and um, didn't have working papers. And uh, he just let me work there, paid me the money and so on. And um, my next door neighbor and I cooked up this plan where I would um, steal liquor from the drugstore, which was where it got sold in, in Michigan. And I would uh, set it out behind the drugstore. He would climb over the fr- fence from where our neighborhood was, grab the bottle and stash it. And after we got a few bottles, he and I would have an overnight and have a party. <laughs> and so we did that. 
and um, I was 14 years old. I have no idea exactly how much we drank, except that I was sick for three days afterwards. So, so it's possible that you know I had alcohol poisoning, and you know was dangerously close to maybe needing to be in the hospital, if not dead. Well, I got in a hell of a lot of trouble for that, of course, and I lost my job at the drugstore, and you know there were plenty of consequences, and I did not like the, that sick feeling that I had. So I didn't drink again for about four years. And then the next time that I drank, um, I had uh, been uh, working second shift at a McDonald's and, and uh, we had had we had worked late. The manager said, well, you guys have done a great job. Here's a bottle of beer for everybody. So I took the beer home and I stashed it in the back of my stereo where nobody could find it. And um, let it sit there for I don't know how long until I got the idea that I'd go ahead and drink it. And um, I popped that bottle of warm beer and drank it and got a bit of a buzz, but it was no big deal. And I still had that that thing in my head about I'm not going to be like my dad. I'm not going to be an alcoholic. Well, um, the next year I discovered marijuana and um, that seemed to me to be the perfect opportunity, right? This this is how things would kind of square away for me. I could smoke dope, um, and I wouldn't drink, and I wouldn't become an alcoholic. And what I didn't pay attention to was the fact that um, every time that we smoked dope, we also drank stuff like Boone's Farm Apple Wine and um, Annie Green Springs and crap like that. And it was every single time we smoked. And um, what I did was that I started smoking every day. I liked it so much that um, I just smoked myself into oblivion every evening and was drinking. And it didn't occur to me that I was drinking on a daily basis or what the possible consequences of that were. So um, I went on my merry way, smoking and drinking um, all the way through my 20s and began to notice when I was later in my 20s that um, I had... uh, uh, some thoughts about how much I liked to drink and began to notice that I kind of needed to drink. And so um, I talked to an aunt of mine who had just come back from treatment and um, I t- said, Aunt Pat, um, and we were at a wedding reception where there was booze flowing like crazy. I said, I think I might be becoming an alcoholic. And she said, Kevin, you? No, not you. You couldn't become an alcoholic, and I was reassured by that. (laughs) And I continued smoking and drinking. And uh, then I talked to a gal that I was dating at that time, and I'll talk a little bit more about the gals that I dated. Um, And uh, she was an alcohol counselor, and and, uh, we spent a lot of time together and (laughs) drank together, and... I asked her, because I was still, I had gotten back to being concerned about it. I asked her, well, do you, do you think I drink alcoholically? And she said, well, was, you know, she asked me three or four questions. She said, no, you're fine. And I was reassured. Okay. Well, over the next couple of years, I continued to worry about this thing of um, maybe I was a little more interested in alcohol than was healthy for me. And um, didn't really have many consequences other than hangovers. Um, I never got a DUI, never lost a job in those days over over alcohol. Um, I just drank and recovered um, on a daily basis and did my job and went to school and got a bachelor's degree and got a master's degree and, you know, just kept kept going. Um, one of the things that you know that I haven't talked about was the secret that I had that that was in in high, that I noticed in high school, and I had a, a pretty big secret. It was a behavior that um, I really couldn't disclose to much of anybody. And the fact was was that um, uh, there was a fellow that I really liked, and he and I used to spend time together. And um, I didn't have words for what was going on at the time, but um, it was a gay relationship. And um, when I got to be about um, 19 or 20, when I was kind of kicking off my drug drug and alcohol career, um, I, I kind of began to understand what it meant. 
and I got very frightened. It was a long time ago. It was in the Midwest. Um, there weren't a lot of people around like me. I felt different. I felt strange. I felt shameful. Um, and um, I, I don't know to what extent that had anything to do with my alcoholism, you know. Um, considering my genetics, um, I came by my alcoholism very honestly. Okay. Um, but uh, I did uh, start trying to what I call heterosexualize myself. And so I, I started going out with, with women and, you know, um, working at becoming straight and uh, had, had some success with that. Um, and as I went forward with that aspect of my life um, and increased the amount that I was drinking and smoking, I began to convince myself that maybe this aspect of my life was passing, that it was not the big deal that, uh, that I had thought it may have been. And I, I uh, got to the point while I was in graduate school that I was drinking enough that I convinced myself that it was okay to get married. And so I went ahead and got married. And um, then subsequent, subsequently, we had two children um, who are wonderful human beings. I'm, I must say I'm a very lucky person. Um, and um, I continued drinking. Um, we moved away from Flint um, right around the same time that I had gone to the doctor and told the doctor that I thought that I was drinking too much. And the doctor gave me some really sound advice. He said, don't drink so much. <laughs> <laughs> and not to sound a little cynical, but it was an HMO, and if, <laughs> if he sent me to a treatment program, it had come out of his pocket, so so the, the solution is don't drink so much, and uh, and I did try that, you know, I would, I would talk to myself during the daytime, and I would say, um, I'm not going to drink today, and so I would have that conversation with myself, and it would go back and forth. And I said, well, maybe I will. No, no, I won't. Maybe, you know, no, no, absolutely not. I'm not going to drink today. And then I would go to the drugstore on the way home from work and get a bottle and go home and start drinking day after day after day. So then we moved to Idaho, and I am probably middle-stage alcoholic by that time, and um, was... Uh, um, getting into reverse tolerance at that point where I was starting to uh, get drunk quicker on less alcohol. And um, I had two, two beautiful little children. Um, and, and one of the consequences that, um, you know, that occurred then was that I was not always a very good dad. I, I didn't have uh, good control of my temper sometimes. I hit them too much sometimes. Okay. Um, and it's it's still a consequence today. So my daughter is uh, going to be 35. My son is 33. Um, and they don't remember it, okay, which I'm grateful for. Um, and I have very positive relationships with both of them. Um, but I still wonder, what did I actually do to them in those moments when I was not being a good parent? Okay. And um, and I'll never know. They're they're both healthy, productive human beings. They're we have good relationships, as I said. Um, they seem to function pretty well. Um, so I don't know. Maybe things would be different if I had been a better parent. Anyway, uh, we get to Idaho, and and a, a little miracle began to occur. And I didn't recognize it as a, a miracle at the time. But um, what began to happen was that. Um, uh, people who were in recovery started kind of gathering around our family. And and I don't know why, but the people that my ex-wife befriended and the people that I befriended were people that were part of recovering families. And nobody said a word to me about my drinking. Okay, But there was one guy, Jerry, who was an alcohol counselor, and um, I, I talked to him. And I told him what was going on. And um, 
one of one of his comments was you you don't sound like you have any denial about it and i said i i am an alcoholic so i can't stop drinking and uh and, and we would talk and he'd kind of patch me together and you know send me on my way and the other the other people were all supportive good friends um and uh i lost my job and um, I lost my job uh, for a combination of reasons. One of them was the bad judgment of choosing to go into a job that I was pretty sure would be a really difficult job because of one of the main personalities that I would be having to work with all the time. Okay. And I knew that going in, but I thought, well, I can tolerate for this for a year. I will get another job after I've been there for a while. And the only problem was this was northern Idaho and jobs were not easily available. So I lost my job and um, money got extremely tight very rapidly. And um, I got another job that was like three quarters of the pay that I was getting from the previous job. And uh, things, things were beginning to get pretty shaky and pretty out of control. Um, I started talking to Jerry more often and uh, we got to a certain point and um, I was standing on the on his back porch with him and that was probably around November 3rd of 1989 and um, he was talking to me as he does and I and uh he says, well, when are you going to stop drinking? And I said, well, I think pretty soon. Thanksgiving's coming, Christmas is coming, New Year's, so maybe maybe in February. <laughs> and Jerry handed me my moment of truth. He said, you, uh, you, you probably want to stop drinking while you still can. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. And what I said to him uh, uh, was probably the first really truthful, sane thing that I said in a long time, which was, I don't know if I can. And um, he said, well, if you do, uh, I want you to take a few days off from work, go to the doctor and, and tell the doctor you need some medication to get through a detox. and and uh you know uh then come talk to me some more and uh, because my judgment was so good um i stopped drinking that my last drink was on that sunday um and on that monday november 5th i went to work just like i usually do and then i started detoxing at work and i worked in a mental health center and so <laughs> Before that, people had thought that I was a counselor, and after that, I'm not sure what they thought. <laughs> anyway, um, I, uh, I was detoxing at work, and I had never really detoxed before. I had, I'd had these periods of time where I wouldn't drink, and, um, and that was part of that job, because I had to be on call for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for one, uh, one week every seven weeks or something like that, so I wouldn't drink in that week. And um, I didn't have any any symptoms of, of withdrawal. It was the weirdest thing in the world. You would think the amount I was drinking and the long the length of time I had been drinking, I would have gone into frank detox. Um, and I didn't. But November 5th, I did. And uh, I had been 24 hours without alcohol. And I started getting the shakes and sweating. And you know, it wasn't terrible, but it was enough for my boss to come up to me and say, you don't look like you feel well. I think you should go home. And of course, my judgment being so very good, I said, oh, no, I'm fine. I'll stay. Okay. But I should have gone home. Anyway, I got through that. And... Uh, because I lived in a small town, I decided that it was probably not a good idea for me to go to AA because people would then know I was an alcoholic. 
And then you think about that for a minute, right? <laughs> um, the florid face, the you know, the breath, etc. Um, and so when I uh, when I decided I would uh, get busy with um, alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous was one year later, and I started noticing that I was obsessing about what it felt like to be drunk. And I had enough sense to go back to Jerry and say, this is what's going on, and I think I better start going to AA, and I think I need a sponsor. And um, so he walked in the other room, and he brings this fellow back, and, and uh, this fellow was, um, I had a, a job on the side teaching at the local college, and so this fellow was one of my students, and he <laughs> says, here's your new sponsor. And I said, no, this won't work. He says, yeah, 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 trust me, this will work. He'll be really good for you. And he was. He was a great guy. Um, he, he took me for, to my first meeting, and I, of course, um, have the gift of gab. I don't have any trouble shutting up under any circumstances. And I go to my first AA meeting, and I am so tongue-tied that I cannot say a word. I couldn't even say, I'm just here to listen. Okay. But the miracle continued, because after I left that meeting, I noticed a radical transformation in the way that I felt. And that radical transformation was that I felt like I had come home. And um, it was uh, uh, the best that I had felt in 20 years. Uh, I continued to go to AA. And I worked the steps with Joe, my sponsor, and um, I did some good work in AA and got started at it. It was it was a wonderful period of time. After three years of sobriety, uh, we moved over here, and one of the things that was happening for me was that my little heterosexual pose was beginning to unravel in my head. And I knew that I was kind of um, in a crisis. And thank God for AA, because that helped me through it. Okay. Um, I was, I felt, you know, so well supported when I lived in Coeur d'Alene. And I move over here, I don't know anybody. And um, uh, I felt very isolated. And I was struggling with a sexual orientation issue. And, and you know, trying to deal with life in a new town and, and didn't have a job at that time and, you know, needed to kind of take care of the kids and get the house in order and get moving on, on the new life. And I was starting to come unraveled and um, went to this meeting um, in Issaquah and um, ran into a guy named Max. And um, I uh, just kind of fell apart with Max and, and told him everything that was going on and he listened and and um, and somehow um, the fact that I was willing to open up to him and he was willing to listen um, connected me to AA in this area. Then the next week um, I noticed how I you know I, I, I don't have many AA buddies I'm, I'm pretty isolated and um, I went back to this same meeting and there, this I saw this guy come in and he was looking really forlorn and kind of, you know, dog-eared and sad and oh my God. And, and I thought, I'll bet you this is his first meeting. So I went up to him and I said, uh, is this your first meeting? And he said, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I said, well, why don't you stick with me and I'll show you the ropes and, you know, we can sit together and blah, blah, blah. And um, that helped me to get better connected to AA. Um, and that fellow is in the room tonight. Okay, so and that and it's like um, that was 1993. Okay, so so there's there's some longevity there. Um, I've got six minutes left. I have to go fast. I had no idea I would talk this much. So um, I've got uh, 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 another sort of crisis that happened with my my uh, AA experience and. Um, and I didn't realize it was a crisis at the time. But what happened was that my ex-wife, with whom I'm still very good friends, um, told me uh, um, several years ago, "You're the only person that I know that has been this that been sober this long and still goes to AA." And that really stuck in my head. Okay, 
And um, I was only going to one meeting a week at that time. And I was sort of forcing myself to go because I just was bored as hell with AA. Okay. A sponsor and a couple of people, they were doing all right. There was, there was absolutely no energy. You know, I was just abdicating my role in taking care of my recovery. So I, I eventually stopped going to AA, and I stopped going to AA for about three years. And um, everything seemed to be pretty fine. I didn't drink. Uh, and uh, then someone that I had known for a long time who had relapsed, um, I connected with and, and um, said, uh, said I, uh, would you like me to be your sponsor? And he said, yeah. And uh, so I thought, well, if I'm going to be somebody's sponsor, I better get a sponsor and I better get my ass back to meetings. And I better take care of, excuse me, I didn't mean to say that. I better get myself back to meetings <laughs> and um, and uh, take care of business here properly. And so uh, his relapse actually helped me to get back to AA. And uh, that was two years ago. And so I'm feeling very comfortable, um, getting a little bit of a push from my sponsor to get a little bit more involved than I am right now, and that's okay, it's goodness, and um, I just, uh, you know, I, I figured out after I got back to AA how ragged I had gotten while I wasn't going to AA those three years, and, and it wasn't real obvious to other people but I was starting to get, to get that old unsureness back and questioning myself and, you know, maybe flying off the handle a little bit more than um, it was, was good, okay? Um, maybe a little bit more road ragey than, than usual. And, um, and I'm, I'm working on that. I'm trying to make you all safe on the road, so try to take care of business with that. Um, but I'm, I'm uh, 27 years sober now. Um, it, has, it has not always been a total happy path. You know, there's been plenty of life challenges that have gone on, you know, getting my divorce, coming out of the closet, um, other things that, you know, have been real big challenges. I left my job at Boeing last August. That's been a big challenge, you know, to kind of adjust to a new phase of life. and. Um, AA is here for me uh, to help me through those things. Um, AA is here to help me guide myself where I can. And when I can't, um, I need to maybe uh, touch bases with my sponsor. Okay. So that's all I've got for tonight. I hope you heard something that, uh, that helps you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.